haste in the wake of George Floyd's uh, murder to pass legislation ostensibly designed at reducing deaths of black people at the hands of law enforcement. I do not believe that this committee has engaged in the deep reflection, the careful thought, and the broad public engagement that effective legislation in this domain requires. The disproportionate rate of deaths of black people at the hands of law enforcement um, or knee are rooted in white supremacy, structural racism, explicit and implicit bias, and deep-seated prejudice against people with perceived mental illnesses. It will require more than a hodgepodge collection of statutory measures from data collection, mandatory body-worn cameras, and a knee bank use of force policy cribbed from the state of California to overcome the structural racism and implicit biases that have allowed police officers to escape prosecution, conviction, and punishment for excessive use of force. Judges, prosecutors, appellate courts, indeed the law itself, are all implicated and work in reinforcing ways to perpetuate these disproportionate killings. This committee needs to understand how investigations of excessive force are carried out by fellow law enforcement officers, how Supreme Court precedent and principles of statutory construction, how prosecu prosecutorial discretion, the rules of evidence, the selection of juries, all conspire to perpetuate the disproportionate use of excessive force against Black people without holding people to account. When I read S-219, I do not have confidence that this committee appreciates the enormity of the problem and the massive undertaking that a solution will require. The work of this committee should be to identify and through legislation, dismantle the policies, the institutional practices, and the cultural norms that have historically failed to deter excessive use of force against Black people and to hold police officers to account for such excessive use of force. I also think the statute as currently written really needs to include and make explicit legislative findings. Um, if this committee truly wishes to introduce a new use of force standard, the committee should include findings to make transparent the committee's intent, analysis, and thought process. Legislative findings serves as a rationale, explicit rationale for legislative action, and they give courts act, they give courts a roadmap to what you were thinking and how the law should be enforced should issues of interpretation come to bear. It also signals to the public that this, that you have engaged in a deliberative process rather than a knee-jerk reaction to current events. I um, have written previously about the necessity for this statute to actually include a definition of necessity, and I've heard other people talk about that, so I won't answer that. But I will address Senator um, Sears' question to um, uh, Ms. Moore about why this statute needs a necessary uh, definition. First of all, the definition of necessary was completely removed out of the the statute in California, it wasn't watered down. And I provided for this committee um, a analysis of the California statute as introduced and as enacted, and that's in the record. And you can see for yourself how that statute was altered through the, through the uh, legislative process. But without a necessary definition, I don't think a court will uphold this statute. I think it will be deemed void as vague uh, I don't think it gives um, clear guidance to officers. And I also think that because of the way structural racism works, by not having a definition of necessary, you have just simply given the system another out uh, to not hold police officers accountable. I now want to talk about body cameras. Um, and, and while I agree that body cameras could provide a good deterrent to excessive force, I don't think this statute as written provides enough of the deterrent uh, for excessive use of force. What I learned during my tenure on the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission, that for some reason, I think police officers are under the impression that body camera recordings are not really uh, reviewed 
uh, during investigations uh, by investigators or supervisors. When I was on the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission, I, re I viewed hours and hours of body camera footage, and I reviewed hours and hours of sworn oral testimony. And many times I found instances where um, there was a discrepancy between what was on the camera and what was testified to orally. Um, and um, so I think that in order to put any teeth into a requirement that people wear body cameras, um, you have to have a provision that allows the public access to the footage. I disagree very much with the ACLU's model body camera policy. Um, that policy, insert, for, for example, limits who can view the body camera footage to people who are subject to it or their legal representatives. And it also says that the way you gain access to the body camera footage is through the Public Records Act. This is another example of how structural racism works. On the face, the ACLU body camera policy looks race neutral. However, when you add in the fact that you have to uh, use the Public Records Act, which requires money and usually a lawyer, um, when you add in the fact that it's so limited to uh, just the people who are the subject of it, um, you, you have effectively, um, again, once perpetuated uh, uh, unequal outcomes based on race. Um, I note that New York, just last week, or earlier this week, New York City, has instituted a policy that in cases of, um, of force, by that includes a stun gun or a handgun, uh, body camera footage will be made available to the public within 30 days by posting it on the internet. That is a way you get around structural racism. It's free, it's available to the public, it's transparent. That's not perpetuating structural racism. That is the way it should be done. And I think this policy, if, it's, if you seriously want to use body cameras to deter excessive force, you need to adopt a policy that allows anyone in the public to see the footage free of charge. Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, did somebody have a... Okay. No. Um, okay. On the, on the part of the statute that deals with improper uh, restraint, I'm, I'm, I'm very confused by it. Um, I have in my written testimony suggested a rewrite of the definition, which I won't get into now. I'll just talk about what I'm confused about. There is a, there is a provision in the statute that provides that um, if an officer uh, uses improper restraint, um, they can be punished up to a maximum of 20 years, imprisoned up to a maximum of 20 years, or fined up to a maximum of $50,000. However, I don't see anything in the statute that, that explains how we get from an officer using improper restraint to a prison sentence. I don't understand if this law is intended to make the use of improper restraint a crime in and of itself that will be adjudicated through the legal system. I don't, it's just really unclear. And it's also unclear why the statute talks about uh, a maximum sentence and no minimum, because the way it's written now, a skillful attorney could successfully argue that no prison sentence or fine is required for the use of, of uh, improper restraint. I just think that it raises more questions than answers for me. Uh, and I pose those all as questions because it's unclear to me um, what, that's, what, what that is uh, all about. I think the statute is also insufficient because it doesn't address the excessive force um, that uh, people with uh, in, in mental health crisis suffer. As I said at the outset, people with so-called untreated um, uh, severe mental illnesses are 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. And this uh, statute does not address um, that, that, that at all. Um, I know based on my um, work on the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission that um, based on my review of all the evidence, I concluded that the root cause of that um, excessive force is 
essentially explicit and implicit biases or unconscious biases against people with mental illnesses, and that simply needs to be addressed. Um, I will stop there in the interest of time, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Wilda. Um, are there questions from the committee? Well, Senator Sears, are you wanting to ask any questions? No, I, I'm, I'm okay. fine. I think uh, Will did a great job of explaining her position. And, uh, Thank I think you. certainly when we get when, tomorrow, when we deal with markup of the bill, we'll certainly look at her suggestions regarding particularly the crime um, section regarding improper restraint. Okay, thank you. So if there are no further questions, uh, Wilda, thank you so much, and I'm glad you've submitted your testimony as well. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks for being on. Um, next, we have Kristen Chandler, who is the training, training coordinator for Team 2. So Kristen, if you would go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I am Kristen Chandler, the training coordinator for Team 2. And I uh, got in touch with Senator Sears because I've been following testimony in this committee. And I just wanted to make sure that um, people are aware of the really good training that is going on in Vermont for law enforcement officers. I also teach uh, Act 80 at the police academy, uh, which is the mandatory mental health training, the eight hour training that's mandated for all law enforcement in Vermont. And I'm a member of the Mental Health uh, Crisis Review Commission as well. Uh, Team Two is a um, voluntary training for not only law enforcement, but mental health crisis workers, dispatchers, EMTs, um, and uh, emergency department personnel are also invited to the training. State's attorneys are invited. And this is a collaborative effort between the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Public Safety that has been in Vermont since 2013. It's offered statewide uh, six times a year in five different regions around the state. And since um, uh, 2014, 2013 was when we trained trainers and there are uh, 35 uh, trainers who are either law enforcement or mental health crisis workers, or I have a couple of dispatchers who are also trainers in those five regions around the state. Um, and since 2014, we've trained about, uh, I want to say 400 law enforcement officers, um, uh, uh, probably 250 mental health crisis workers or clinicians of some, of some type, and a whole host of dispatchers and uh, other folks. Um, the point of the training is um, to, to foster that collaborative effort in responding to a mental health crisis. It's to build relationships, really, which is key to a peaceful and healthy outcome um, to any kind of mental health crisis. There's a steering committee uh, that's made up of not only law enforcement, but uh, consumers. Um, NAMI, uh, Lori Emerson from NAMI is on the steering committee. There's the mental health uh, designated agencies have representation. Um, Dale. The Department of Aging Independent Living has a spot uh, as well as ADAP because of the, um, so often there is a co-occurring disorder. So uh, the steering committee helps um, design the curriculum. Um, it's a scenario-based training that's, uh, we run through three different scenarios in this one day training that are focused on the legal aspects, the clinical aspects and uh, the safety aspects of a particular crisis. And they're all based on real life uh, scenarios. And it, it, it occurs, to, I mean, it, it, it seems like not many people um, are always aware that this training exists in Vermont. And I have uh, had the um, good fortune this past year uh, to go to three different national conferences, uh, including the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, to present what we're doing here in Vermont. And it's really unique. And it's, um, you may have heard of crisis intervention training, which is a 40 hour training, which is offered um, in major metropolitan areas. And it's sort of the gold standard of mental health response for law enforcement. And it's a, a five day training. 
in Vermont, there's one police department that's offering that, and that's the Hartford Police. And I teach the legal aspect of that um, during that training as well. And this team two is really a, a response to crisis intervention training for a rural area because it's so hard for um, police agencies to send officers to a, a full five day training, uh, especially given the number of agencies we have here who have very small departments but they can send somebody to a one day training. And we have seen um, incredible response, uh, incredible learning going on uh, through this training. And it's, it's, there's a continued need. Um, there are definitely areas in Vermont where that idea of collaborating in response for law enforcement to call on their mental health counterparts, the experts really in the field to assist them at a scene or to assist them in figuring out how to uh, de-escalate a situation where it's not um, it's not like an automatic thought by law enforcement um, and there are but but for example Washington County has enjoyed that kind of collaborative relationship for a very long period of time which is really the the genesis of team two came from uh, that model that Washington County has done uh, for years uh, so there's still work to be done for sure um, and there are, uh, every year uh, through the grant, um, there's a requirement for me to write a final report and that's available for you. Um, there's also, um, there's a list in, in the final report of all the people who've attended, people who, and the agencies that have never attended. And it is um, a voluntary training. That being said, the Vermont State Police identified Team 2 about two years ago. Um, Captain Scott identified it. He was on the steering committee and made it a priority for Vermont State Troopers. So they're trying to send all their troopers through the training, um, which has been really helpful. Um, of the, There's probably 10 police agencies that have never sent anybody to the training. And of those agencies, uh, they're mostly really tiny small departments, but the two that stick out for me that I, I um, continue to hope would they will um, see that this is a valuable training is the Chittenden County Sheriff they've never attended and the St. Johnsbury Police. Um, so every, every um, training session, uh, it's done regionally because it's important that the people who work in the same region connect with each other. Uh, I send out invitations to the chiefs. It's posted on the Criminal Justice Training Council website when the trainings are. Uh, it's free for law enforcement. And like I said, this is a collaborative grant between the Department of Public Safety and, and DMH. And it's not a whole lot of money. I just want to mention that. It's about a $100,000 grant, but it's, it's tenuous. It's year to year. Um, DMH's contribution is about uh, $80,000 and the state police uh, put in $20,000. Um, and there's been um, you know, some concern that because of uh, budget cuts and you know, the need to trim uh, budgets that team two would be, could be one of those things that goes away. And I just really, um, I can't emphasize enough the value in this training um, that I have seen and have gotten direct feedback from um, consumers um, who have, uh, um, and I'll just tell you, recently dealt with um, somebody who just went through the training. And I just want to tell you this one, this one tidbit, because part of the training involves um, not only those scenarios, but also um, a lot of discussion, just frank discussion about how to handle different situations. And in particular, we cover um, how to work with people who are on the autism spectrum because those calls have become very frequent. And just recently uh, in the beginning of June, um, there was a call, a 911 hang up call with a 12 year old on the autism spectrum that is sort of a repeated, this is a, it has happened more than once. And the officer who responded, who had just gone through Team 2 training and had learned some stuff about um, what, what it's like for somebody on the autism spectrum. And his response uh, to that 12-year-old was really remarkable um, because the 12-year-old wanted to touch him. He wanted to touch all his uh, duty belt and all of his equipment. And the officer recognized that that was 
um, something he learned at the training that would happen, and he let that happen. Uh, I got um, incredible feedback from the parents who had uh, previously had a different officer respond and not not in a good way. Um, so there were real, um, and there's all kinds of anecdotes like that. And you may, um, you might be familiar with, uh, there's once a year I put out something called the Good News Bulletin, which is um, sort of a, a synopsis from around the state of various um, calls that have gone really well, um, where there's been great collaboration between the designated mental health agency and local law enforcement, um, or it's just local law enforcement who've used the tools they've learned at Team 2 training uh, to have a really a good outcome where um, it, we've seen a real, real improvement where in the past, uh, the idea was, you know, get it done quick, get it done, as, uh, get get the call over as soon as you can, because I got to get on to the next call. And we really talk about slowing things down, using time, and using your partners in the field, such as mental health crisis clinicians, um, dispatchers, and emergency department personnel and other folks uh, to come up with a safe and effective uh, resolution to a mental health crisis. So that's um, that's the synopsis of uh, what Team Two is, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, committee members, are there questions for Kristen? Uh, we <clears throat> we have another person, um, Kristen, uh, who's list uh, Jeanette White is listening on the phone now, also. So just so that she okay. didn't cut out. <laughs> um, Okay, very good. So that's very helpful. I like that you mentioned all the parts that um, I had questions about, like, is it mandatory? What's it cost, et cetera. So thank you for coming. You bet. And next on our agenda, the next three persons to speak will be um, George Karabakis, the CEO of Healthcare Rehab Services in Springfield, Michael Fitzgerald, the chief of the Brattleboro Police Department, and Chief Fakos, the Montpelier Police Chief, who is soon retiring. So. So George is not here yet, um, nor is Michael. I emailed them both and told them they're up. So hopefully they'll join soon. So you might want to move on to. Okay. So that means we would move on to you, Chief Fakos. And after that, Mike O'Neill and Rebecca Turner, unless the other persons are here and we'll go back to them. So if you could start, uh, Chief, that'd be great. Uh, Thank you, and thank you for having me, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, and be behind me is also my successor, this is Chief Brian Pete. So uh, he, I will, you know, one thing I will say very quickly, uh, he also is a presenter at the International Associated Chiefs of Police on a specific grant that he um, was awarded for CIT work in his previous uh, agencies, and agency in Alamogordo. And also, um, body cams are an immediate priority as well from where he's coming from. Um, my comments will be, will be short, given uh, all the testimony that you've already heard. Uh, so when it comes to data collection and accountability for agencies, we strongly, strongly support this. Uh, and also making sure that, that the data is readily available to not only law enforcement to look at our practices, sometimes we can even see, uh, you know, evidence of implicit bias, but also that the public can see that. And that also includes even how we how we classify and and quantify use of force, because it's not just the number of times that the force is used, but I personally think it's very important to the public understand the circumstances in which uh, force is applied in in, uh, in our operations as, as police uh, police officials. Uh, the you know, and, and also the Vermont Police Association, who I'm speaking on behalf of right now, we also support holding those agencies accountable. I mean, we need to make sure that um, if agencies are falling through the cracks, that there are various mechanisms that we can, um, through the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, which covers most of the municipal departments in Vermont, uh, but there's a roadmap to get them uh, the support and structure that they need. So we have that consistency and that expectation of service that all Vermonters and visitors certainly deserve. Uh, with regard to the, um, the use of force and the, and the application and the, of improper restraint um, and the prohibition of it, the one glaring piece to me is that it does not allow for a, you know, a qualifier in a deadly force situation. In other words, if an officer is fighting for his or her life, um, 
you know, they're, they're going to do, they have to do whatever they can to, to survive that encounter. And I think that's one thing I'm not seeing here, uh, even though absolutely, I mean, it's been a prohibited uh, hold, uh, you know, head, neck, and spine. We're even in our own training every year, we're on the mats. Uh, you know, our instructors are really good, even if it's accidentally. Hey, watch where your that arm is, watch where your knee is. Um, you know, as we're just even going through the, the techniques annually uh, in our own department. So I think there needs to be something there that in a deadly force fighting for your life situation um, that any officer has the ability, the ability to use whatever they need to to survive um, that encounter. Seth. That's it? Uh, no, there's. Oh, OK. Senator Baruth. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, so Officer Fakos, I, I see your point. Um, the struggle for me is when I look at the incidents we've seen nationwide, where there is deadly force employed, um, often against black or brown uh, victims, the answer on the part of the officer and their attorney, usually after a period of, um, of silence, is to say that the officer feared for their life, and in that fear, they employed deadly force. So how do we separate what you're saying, which is, uh, you know, an actual situation where someone had no other opportunity from what we see as a, a, a very basic standard defense that's often promulgated by police unions, the, the idea that um, anytime the officer experiences or, or says they experience fear, they are licensed to go to deadly force. Well, even in your, the additional wording in the bill itself, you know, there, there's more than just fear. I mean, what what are the, again, the totality of the facts and circumstances. I will tell this committee, I don't know if I would be here today if it wasn't for a very, if I had not used um, an in, what is deeming as improper chokehold. When I was a young officer, two officers were, uh, my partner and I were the only ones on in Montpelier, uh, once it was the late 80s, early 90s. Two, three in the morning, um, we had somebody who was a, a logger by trade, um, allegedly on all, uh, uh, cocaine, had was was injured, had jumped through a store, a plate glass window of a door at back when there used to be a liquor store at the corner of Berry Street and Main Street. So there's when we roll up, he is on his hands and knees, he's injured, and he's growling, and uh, my partner's on one, his cruiser's on one side, I am the other side. I get on my car and it's like trying to de-escalate. Hey, we're here to help. What's wrong? Because he's clearly injured from, you know, cuts on his leg. He stands up. He's still growling. It charges me. I def so I go to deflect him, uh, his body away from the, uh, the full on charge on me. Uh, but I didn't block a right punch, took a significant blow. At that point, my partner engages with him um, as I'm a little, you know, rattled. Next thing I'm rolling around again with him. I had no idea that my, how badly my injured my partner was. Um, and at one point when we're rolling around now on the sidewalk, uh, he's, you know, he's desperately trying to grab my firearm, which we had revolvers back then. And so I had to disengage to keep him away from my firearm. And but we, again, going round and round fighting with him, we ended up back in the street. At this time, I'm on top of him. Um, and he's now he's trying to, he's bite, he got a, he was able to bite my hand. And I had a device called a Handler 12. It was something that we no longer use, but it's a control and restraint as well as an impact tool. It's kind of a metal uh, rubberized hook type, type, type device. And it wasn't until this fight's going on and on and on, he's still trying to get my firearm. But I'm also concerned, if I, you know, like if I did pull out my firearm, you know, since we're, you know, we're grappling around, um, am I, you know, is it gonna get even worse? Uh, and, um, and I'm, you know, injured, you know, my partner, I had no idea how badly my partner was injured. It wasn't until I started using an improper hold by this, by this standard um, knowing that it was deadly force, even back then. Uh, but I had to, you know, but only I could gain control of him and, and save my own life at that point, that he started to come into compliance. And that was the first time when my partner was trying to handcuff him. I realized my partner only had use of one arm. His rotator cuff was torn so, so severely um, that he had lost the use of it at the, at the time. Uh, we got him the, with the ambulance, we transported him. I share that story because uh, only because um, 
you know, here, would, would I be com committing, even the earlier version, would I be committing a felony uh, to defend myself? And I have, you know, and it was what was available in that fight at that time with somebody who was desperately trying to hurt me and my partner, as well as, um, uh, you know, trying to get my firearm. And it wasn't until I used that, 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 ta that tactic um, out of desperation in that fight that was the first time he actually said a human word from, as, as opposed to growling in the rage to, I can't breathe. Um, and as soon as he was secured in handcuffs, obviously that was immediately released as soon as he was contained and put on the stretcher. And by the way, he did also in the ER, he also bit the attending physician. Um, and so uh, I only share that because um, had I not used that tactic, uh, you know, would, how that, would that situation resulted in, in a firearm discharge or me being killed? Uh, if I might follow up, Madam. Um, briefly in that, you know, okay. we, wanna, we do wanna get the rest of the testimony. So yep. go ahead. And uh, officer, I, I understand that um, as you tell the story, there was nothing else that could have been done. Um, I, if I'm right, we have non-lethal tools now that you carry with you. Uh, such as a taser, am I right? Montpelier, uh, by, again, community policing, listening to um, the, the, our, the, the citizens of Montpelier, it was heavily debated. It was something that I did advocate for uh, early on as a chief in Montpelier, um, but because it was dividing the community, we, we listened and we opted not to go with that, that, that technology. So we do not have tasers in Montpelier. Yep. We, simply, we have batons and pepper spray. I, I think there are other communities that have other non-lethal tools, but I guess what I would go back to is we haven't seen what defense the officer who was responsible for the death of George Floyd will use, but I would imagine he will argue that he was in fear for his life and that he had no other option but to kneel on his neck or to cut off his wind. Now, he may well lose in court and you had you been prosecuted, may well have won your case. But I guess what I'm saying is, if we put in language that allows uh, this to be used in certain circumstances, it seems to me that we will then have every deaf use that as the defense. And so I was sincere in asking at the beginning of my interrogation, if you have suggestions for language that will help us uh, you know, find the sweet spot, I would be very interested to see that. Uh, I, yeah, I, I certainly, again, in every other context, absolutely, you know, support the codification of, of banning uh, this whole something that, again that is in our training and has always been considered a lethal force. Whenever you're dealing with um, something that's gonna that's gonna you know uh, this, you know disturb the flow of blood or or obviously cut off somebody's ability to breathe, um, you know the comparison of the of the of the situation that I personally was in, uh, comparing that to, you know, the, the absolute criminal murder by my my perspective of what I saw, like everybody else in Minneapolis, are two very different situations. Um, and and you know, I wrote a letter, uh, you know, uh, that week, uh, um, you know, saying and such. I mean, what that that how that situation, that criminal conduct, uh, but you know, damaged and further eroded public trust and policing, as well as adding to the fear of um, marginalized communities. And that was why we, you know, we in law enforcement and our, the Montpelier Police Department really wanted to make a clear statement. And then, you know, and in many other, we've heard across the state of Vermont, law enforcement saying that was outrageous, that was so wrong and criminal. So I don't have the exact word, the words to use, except that anytime anybody's fighting for their life, they should be, you know, uh, whatever they have to do is in that situation. Um, and I think that's also where um, somebody, you know, it's not just the fear. I mean, this was real. Uh, matter of fact, my situation I described was witnessed by uh, actually a DJ at the time of WNCS and commented um, that, you know, he was waiting for me to shoot the person. Uh, but again, I could have also, once I cleared, you know, if I were able to get my weapon out, would it also jeopardize me even further or, and my partner? Thank you. So do you have any uh, further comments on the rest of the... Um... Uh, just that, um, again, this is, uh, 
21st century policing, all of these reforms that, you know, that, that you're taking up um, and variations of that, there is definitely a sense of urgency to implement you know, the, right, the right steps in accountability and guidance for police officers. Uh, I definitely uh, strongly support um, public safety's uh, you know, 10 points uh, uh, for modernization. Uh, some of those we're still trying to figure out, such as what does uh, community, you know, community oversight look like and, and to what authority and, and impact will they have on police policy, on police accountability. But back to 21st century policing, uh, something that's been, that's the cornerstone of the philosophy of the Montpelier Police Department, those six pillars. 2016, uh, I, I was I took advantage of an invitation to the White House with uh, then Chief Trevor Whipple and Chief Leanne Toomey, where we talked about policy and, and actual practical, uh, how do we, you know, imp how do we actually deploy those six pillars in, in, you know, in action? Uh, and that include, included uh, a, you know, wonderful training from, from Dr. Marks from Morehouse College on implicit bias. Uh, years, a year later, two years later, um, you know, Chief Del Pozo um, was able to get Dr. Marks up to, to Burlington. Every one of our supervisors went through that training. We've brought in people from, uh, in our promotional process. Uh, we've had, um, you know, outside, uh, you know, a representative from the community of color and to participate in that, to ask specific questions of candidates of the Montpelier Police Department about um, from, you know, 21st century policing to make sure that the officers, not just the command staff, understand and embrace those six pillars, technology how, and, and all that. So everything that is here, the rest of it, with that, um, you know, the Vermont Police Association does support the data. They, they you know, that they're, uh, we echo what, what Commissioner Sherling has already said about um, language that's in statute, but having a uniform uh, policy that we all have the same expectations across the state. We, how we okay, thank you very much. And could we just um, maybe, the new chief could just come forward, just wondering, um, we're in Montpelier normally, and we probably will see you regularly. So just wondering. <laughs> Just come forward and say hello. Your new okay. chief. I see in the background. I, I missed part of that, but yeah. Alice, uh, yeah. I'm wondering. Somebody just came in M one two four three, and it seems like there's a lot of background noise associated with them. Yes, there is. Okay. There, they've Could muted. Senator, that question. We just wanted to say hello, since we'll we're all going to be in Montpelier at some point. So thank you both very much for being there and, and speaking. So next, next on the schedule, we'll go back to George Karabakis from Healthcare Rehab Services and is, uh, let's see, is Michael Fitzpatrick also available? Um, Alice, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Can't hear you, Philip. I'm wondering if Peggy can tell us who M1243 is because they they keep muting and unmuting with noise. Yep. Is it Michael Fitzgerald M1243? Yes. Okay, you, you need to to mute. Uh, if, if you would mute yourself, um, Michael, we'll start with George and you might share your time with him, but we'll start with George who is on. So Go ahead, George. But if you could mute yourself, Michael, while we're hearing from George, please. I don't. I don't think he gets it, Alice. I can. I can mute. I'm going to okay. mute you, Michael. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, George, go ahead, please. You're muted too. There we go. I think I'm good. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um, first of all, I well. I am George Karabatakis, uh, CEO of HCRS, and we are the um, designated community mental health agency serving Windham and Windsor counties, and it's uh, an honor to, to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, and also, Chief um, uh, Michael Fitzgerald from Brattleboro uh, will be uh, also uh, joining me in terms of uh, sharing a little bit about the program that I, I wanted to talk about. And uh, the, you know, we're talking about, I mean, there's, I, I certainly heard what uh, uh, Chief Fakos 
spoke to, and um, we we have um, developed a program in southeastern Vermont and and in Brattleboro, but throughout southeastern Vermont, that I think is an alternative and is an option. And um, so I just want to uh, spend you know a few minutes speaking about that. You know the you know the reality is that law enforcement is oftentimes at first stop when there are challenging situations that arise, you know, whether they're mental health, substance use, domestic violence issues, a whole range of behaviors that often, oftentimes lead officers to being called by family members and neighbors and individuals in need. And, and these calls come from a whole range of sources of services and sources, including homeless shelters, schools, emergency rooms, healthcare providers, social service providers, and given that a significant number of the total calls that a police department might receive, these are issues, the, the issues that I just mentioned, that really require the kind of collaboration that is necessary. Uh, and I, I, I know it, at, in our programs, the, the, that collaboration is with, with HCRS, um, as well as many other social service providers. And in 2003, uh, which was almost 18 years ago, we worked with the uh, Bellows Falls Police Department to develop a police social work program. And it was so successful and it made such a difference in reducing calls and reducing contacts uh, with the police department that we expanded it. And over the years, we expanded it from Brattleboro to Hartford, where we have a case manager, an HCRS case manager or community support specialist who is uh, embedded and is co-located with, uh, um, with the officers in the various police departments. What they do is provide de-escalation, they establish rapport, they work with issues that the individual might have, some of the, uh, really respond to their individual needs, uh, make the appropriate referrals, whether it's for housing, whether it's for healthcare, whether it's truancy issues or mental health or substance use issues or or in some cases because people are so isolated uh, it might simply be building connections in the community to help those individuals succeed and and most importantly to help reach people proactively at an earlier stage so we can minimize the risk and the impact and keep them out of criminal justice system, keep them uh, out of a system which isn't really what most likely what they need. Uh, the work that our staff do is it's on the street, it's in the community, it's in people's homes, in motels, in schools, wherever that need might be. It might simply be sitting at the kitchen table talking about what that individual, uh, what their life circumstances are. And so, uh, you know, recently we, re we received a call from uh, a health officer in one of our towns regarding a gentleman who'd been uh, living in a rented space in one room where it turned out if you walked in, there were things from the floor to the ceiling, a whole range of things. It was, there was a massive bed bug infestation. This is someone who had some pretty significant mental health challenges, who had some very uh, un, uh, some medical issues that had not been addressed, uh, and who was facing eviction. And so the police social work liaison was called, went in, helped support that individual, work with that individual to make sure that they got the health care they needed, the mental health supports they needed. Uh, they uh, we worked with, or that individual worked with the housing provider with uh, long-term shelter options uh, and also help them uh, address the issues around transportation because that was a pretty significant issue uh, among many others and to help support that person get connected so they weren't isolated. And there are so many situations where people's lives have been changed because of those connections. Our team is really closely connected to uh, our children's services, adult services, our developmental services, as well as getting support from our peer support team. We have a pretty solid, we have a really great peer support program at ACRS, and I feel that connection uh, really could benefit from expansion, and I think they're doing some great work 
And um, so that, um, and I should also add that our police social work liaisons work really closely with social service providers throughout the community. We currently have six police social work liaisons serving uh, Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, Springfield, Windsor, Hartford, uh, Weathersfield and Ludlow have access to police social work staff. We also have a police social work liaison who is embedded in the Vermont State Police in the Westminster Barracks, which I believe serves 26 towns. Uh, and actually on the handout that I passed that I sent, um, Christine Bullard is there with Lieutenant French and uh, had received the team two, one of the team two training uh, awards uh, this past year, uh, and they've been doing a, a great job. We also, through a HRSA grant, which is um, Health Resources Services Administration's federal grant, uh, we're putting, we've pulled together a community coalition around opiate and substance use, uh, and um, so we have, through those funds, and now have a police social work liaison with the Wyndham County Sheriff's, as well as Wilmington and Dover. Uh, and you, you know, if you've ever been there, you know you can't get there from here. And it's having someone there is really critical. So we've just literally hired that person within the last few weeks. Uh, the staff in these positions operate differently in each community because each community is unique. So we're responding uniquely to the needs of those communities to help support people to in many ways level the playing field and make sure that they get the services and the supports that they need because in most, the likelihood is they don't need to be incarcerated. They don't need the, to enter into the criminal justice system. They need support and they need services. And we've been doing this uh, for 17 years and it's been a great <clears throat> really a, a great program that has been replicated throughout the state. There's a lot of, I think, a lot of designated agencies that have really built up their collaborations with law enforcement. And I think it's something that really should be taken a look at. Uh, we have in the last year, we've impacted 888 adults, 189 children, uh, and we've had 577 interventions, uh, police social work interventions. Uh, and I would, uh, anyway, I, I, there's more I could say about that, but uh, <clears throat> I just, I, I really want to, uh, I think it's important uh, to share, uh, you know, that this program really can provide the kind of uh, early intervention that can support folks in our community so that there isn't the need for further contact. And um, so in any event, that's uh, a little bit about the um, our program. Great. And I don't know if you have any questions I, uh, or if uh, Chief so uh, Fitch, oh, there's uh, Chief Fitzgerald has any thoughts or yeah. anything to share. George, we'll, we'll go to um, Chief Fitzgerald in shortly. Is there are there any questions for <clears throat> before we go on to um, Chief Fitzgerald? I think we lost him. I don't see him. No, he's uh, he, I see him on the upper line. On the oh, right. there he is. Sorry about that. So, so thank you very much, George. Good work. And now, uh, just to I just want to say something else that um, Senator White is hopefully on the phone someplace um, because she will be back at about 1030. And Senator Sears, our chairman is on the line listening. Um, they had some other things come up that they had to miss this right now. But um, Chief Fitzgerald, if you would go ahead, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize for my lack of technology ability earlier, but I truly appreciate um, your, your time in this and I respect your time and I'll keep it very short. I would just like to echo what uh, George was saying. We've, we've had a, a social worker on staff for uh, approximately uh, 12 years now and um, they are critical. They are critical to the success of my department and I don't say that lightly. They're, they're just as, uh, their prevention helps us greatly. It has reduced um, use of force 
that we have used. It's it's a positive, um, long term uh, addition to solutions to some of the uh, incidences that we respond to. Not only that, we have a trainer that is embedded with my staff that helps us uh, when we have questions on dealing with mental health uh, crises on the best way to handle that. I mean, we, we got a subject matter expert uh, right right in our, our back room. So um, once again, I know your time is, is precious and I really appreciate that. I, I can't emphasize enough how critical uh, having that component um, embedded with the police department is to the success of uh, community policing within the state. And so I just would ask you one question. Um, how is the per, how is the how are the trainer and the social worker paid for? Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me, officer. I can speak to that. Uh, well, about 18 years ago, uh, we started this program uh, sort of on a, a a prayer and a dime. I don't know whatever that phrase is, but it was a patchwork of funding, United Way and. Uh, town funding and we put in match dollars and we started small and we end. But to, to cut to the chase, uh, all of the police social work liaisons with the exception of the one that I mentioned that is funded through the HRSA grant, which is a federal grant, uh, are funded primarily through Act 79 dollars. Uh, Post Irene, there was Act 79, which supported community alternatives. We as an organization felt that it was so important to have this kind of partnership. That's that. That's where we put those dollars. We could have put them in crisis services, or we could have put them in outpatient services, uh, or or community other community other services. But we felt this was important. So it's primarily Act 79. There is some fee for service Medicaid, uh, but. Uh, quite honestly, uh, they do not generate revenue, so it's got to be grant dollars because the nature of the program is whether it's health and safety checks or whether it's going out with uh, to address the needs of individuals who frequently contact uh, the police department uh, and their referrals. Uh, billing uh, fee for service is problematic. You're not going to go and start asking for all that information, you, you do what you need to do to help support that individual. So it, it, it's gonna be grant dollars or funds that are uh, leveraged through global commitment. Uh, so that's primarily how it's funded through the uh, designated, through HCRS. Um, Thank you. Um, so are there other questions from the committee for either George or Chief Fitzgerald? Okay. Well, thank, thank you both very much for speaking to us. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just say one thing? <clears throat> I do want to say, I think I'd be remiss in saying that the partnership with, uh, with the Brattleboro Police Department has really been outstanding in terms of the community connections and supports. And I really have to, I, I just feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't say that because I think we've got a department that's really working hard to support alternatives and collaborations. And I think that's really important uh, in any community. So I thank, I just wanna thank the committee and all of you as well, so. Thank you both very much. So next on the agenda is um, Mike O'Neill, president of the Vermont Troopers Association, then Rebecca Turner, the Chief Appellate Defender for the Defender General's Office, and Jessica Brown, Supervising Attorney of the Chittenden County Public Defender's Office. So if Michael, if you would please go ahead. Good morning, um, I'm Michael Neal, the Executive Director of the Vermont Troopers Association, just for the record. Um, I'm going to start my testimony much differently than I planned on. Um, my unmuted comment out of context sounded like it was intended to be negative, but it wasn't, so I'm going to share a story and it was my daughter that I was speaking to. She was behind me and I recently told her a story with everything that's going on in the news about a training I attended that Tabitha was at with members of the Fair and Impartial Committee as well as the State Police Command staff. The trainer had showed a video that was intended to be an example 
of how white privilege impacts um, many young children. And it was a young black girl that was shown in the video. And at the end of it, I was at a loss to even have a comment about the video, as were most of my coworkers that were there with us. And Tabitha was very surprised by that and had a very passionate response and really forced us to think about something that I had never experienced in life and didn't understand. And it was actually a very positive impact on me. And that's why I had shared the story with my daughter about Tabitha. And I've also told several other people that. I didn't realize I wasn't muted and it didn't come across that way, but it was intended to be in a very positive way. She helped me understand something that day that I had never experienced in life and did not know. So I will call her and make sure that she hears that from me. And I apologize that I was unmuted, but I'm not sure that turned out to be a bad thing because I think it's important to, for people to hear that we are open to change. We are open to learning about different cultures. I did not grow up in an environment where that was something I understood in life. So I will move on to my comments and my apologies, but it truly was intended as a positive comment. I wanted my daughter to know who she was. And I said, she blasted us in some ways she did that day. And it was a good thing for most of us that were there. So I, I will move on and I will call her later. Um, the Vermont Troopers Association supports many of the positive reforms that are being discussed. Our board has taken a few votes on these issues recently, and we supported Commissioner Sherling's proposals that he made to Senate govern government operations um, on the 10 points that he made. But on S219, I'd like to just make a few comments. We, we do support the race data section of this and the ability to force compliance of departments that aren't currently doing these things and the improvements to it. Um, we do support the use of body cameras. Videos have been a part of law enforcement in Vermont, video cameras for close to 20 years. They're in all of our cruisers. They're an important part of everything we do. Um, documentation is one of the cornerstones of law enforcement. You, know, you can't do the job and build a solid criminal case without documenting what you do and video reflects things very accurately. They, there's no question about what has taken place. So we support video cameras. This will just enhance what we are currently doing. Our members currently have a body mic on them all the time. So although everything they do may not be captured in video, most of it is captured with audio. Um, unless they go too far from the cruiser and the body camera will solve that problem. So we are in support of those. The policy on the uh, use of lethal force, uh, we also support this. Um, we think it's important that there is a statewide uniform policy. I agree with Commissioner Sherling that I heard testify um, a couple of days ago that it may be something that is better in a policy that is mandated by the legislature. So there is the ability for it to be always evolving, changing and improving. But I don't know the best way to handle this. Um, it seems to make sense that we need to at times change this and it may be easier to change if it's in a mandated policy. Um, Chief Fakos explained very well one of our concerns in that chokeholds are not appropriate as a control tactic. We do not use them, they're against our policy, but they may be necessary as a means of lethal force. And Senator Baruth, uh, I appreciate your concern there. I understand that. Um, and there may be a fine line where the policy or the law needs to address this, but that is one of our concerns that it not be eliminated as a means of lethal force if necessary. And I do understand the concerns. Um, the improper conduct section of S219, we also support. The VTA worked with um, several stakeholders in the Senate Government Operations Committee on Act uh, 56 that was passed a couple of years ago that dealt with unprofessional conduct. And this adds to that and we think improves that. Um, one of the last comments I'd like to make is about police unions. There is a perception out there that police unions are an obstacle or a hindrance in ensuring that bad police officers are disciplined or removed. 
Uh, I don't believe from the perspective of the uh, Troopers Association, that is true. There is nothing in our contract that prohibits discipline from being imposed. Our goal is very simple, to ensure that whatever discipline is imposed is fair and just. You know, we have a process for appealing any discipline to the Vermont Labor Relations Board, but we don't have an interest in maintaining an employee they should not be on the job. That, that's not in the interest of anyone in law enforcement. We just, our, our, our goal is to just ensure that discipline is fair. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, Mike. Uh, are there questions for um, Mike? Dick Sears has a question, if it's okay. Go ahead, Senator Sears. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, committee. Again, if you didn't hear me, I'm sorry I'm not there. And Zoom person, um, but I'm with my wife in Albany, New York at a doctor's office. My question, Mike, um, really is about the use of force or improper restraint and how we get to a point where um, it's obviously uh, the situation that the chief described, the situation that you're concerned with, um, is how do we restrain someone? But I, I, I go through this as someone who's gone through restraint training, who's actually done restraints. And I'm not sure what the concern is. I mean, the, the question is not whether or not um, you're defending yourself or whatever else, but the question is whether as part of your restraint of that person, you are employing either um, a chokehold, I hate that term, by the way, um, but you're employing some form of restraint that involves um, affecting the person's ability to breathe. Persons, uh, and we saw what happened uh, in Minneapolis um, and how, um, how anyone could, could even believe that was a proper use of restraint is beyond me. Um, and once the person is um, under control, under the restraint, um, the first thing you do is try to de-escalate. Um, the beginning of it is de-escalation. So I didn't see any de-escalation um, in um, Minneapolis. And in what you're describing um, was everything else done. There's always there's there's always things for question. And I'm you know in a in a in a wrestling match or something. There may be a uh, something happens while you're doing that, but that's not part of the restraint. It's when you're actually doing the restraint and you actually are inhibiting that person's ability to breathe. So thanks. I'm going to have to mute myself. Um, thank you. Um, if I could just respond to that, I, I believe I agree with Senator Sears on this. Um, my concern is not at all about using those type of holds as a restraint. It would only be if you were in a situation like Chief Fakos described, where it becomes a situation where you're using that as lethal, deadly force. I, I would never advocate that it be used as a restraint. I completely agree what happened in Minneapolis can never be justified in any way and was a criminal act. Um, my concern is just that the law does not limit the type of hold from becoming a lethal force situation, if ever necessary. It should never be used as a restraint or any way of controlling someone. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, anyone else with a question on the committee? Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Mike. So next we will go to um, Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's office, then Jessica Brown, and then next uh, Jeffrey Jones. So go ahead, Rebecca, please. Thank Morning. you. Morning, thank you, Senator Nicka. Uh, my name is Rebecca Turner for the record. I am the head of the appellate division for the office of the Defender General, as was previously indicated. Um, but beyond that, I also come to share my perspective uh, working as a public defender in the system for over 13 years now, almost 13 years, 
uh, where I've seen up close and represented people of color who uh, have cases and wind up in the criminal juvenile justice system, family court system, after, of course, the initial encounters with officers, right? Where I have seen the transcripts, where I've talked with my clients and the families about what they experienced. And while I commend the, the committee and the legislature for taking up um, some legislation in response to events that are happening, uh, I think my point here, uh, I wanna make clear my limited time to talk with you is that it has to be considered as just the start, right? That if we are serious about true police reform, we need to go beyond data. We need to go beyond considering policies for use of force, creating new crimes. Um, and that's because true police reform, we have to acknowledge and understand the various systems in place that keep and isolate uh, and insulate police misconduct and allow that to continue. Uh, you know, there have been references to police unions, hiring and firing practices, uh, transparency, accountability outside of um, the Department of Public Safety. There is that. There's also the infrastructures built into the criminal justice system itself, the standards that are forgiving, that again allow and insulate this misconduct to continue. But coming back to and looking specifically at the bill at hand, um, S219, I saw it, you know, saw it in three parts, and I wanted to start with the data provision, right? And again, um, I'm glad to see language linking compliance with funding, because a theme throughout has to be not just requirement, but how, what are going to be the consequences for failing to uh, follow through? And, and, and the data language there, linking it to funding is important, but it doesn't go far enough, right? It's limited to traffic stops and analyzing traffic stops, but we need data collection with police encounters with pedestrians on the street. Okay? We need data collection based on what prosecutors are doing once they get the arrests. Who are they charging? What counts are they charging? Once they charge, are they asking for bail, hold without, conditions? We also need to know data from the courts. What are the courts doing when faced with these requests? Are they imposing conditions differently based on the race of the defendant before them? Ethnicity, gender, right? Who's getting convicted? What kind of sentences are being asked for? Again, looking at the prosecutors, what are the judges imposing? Once those sentences are imposed, what's going on at DOC? How are those sentences actually being served? Who's getting out on furlough, on parole? Who's getting revoked? Who's in segregation? Who's getting DRs? Again, we need data all across through the system from beginning to end. Right now, this legislature has started and just focused on traffic stops. It's just the beginning. I wanna to turn to the use of force provision. There's been a lot of testimony, good testimony already uh, critiquing the need to have more concrete standards and I support that. There's been discussion about the reasonableness uh, issues, the slipperiness of that language, right? And again, the concern being is that with vague standards, we allow the misconduct and to continue because we isolate the officers around a general sense of what's reasonable. Uh, there was a question from the committee yesterday from, I believe it was uh, Senator Benning, in terms of making wanting to make sure we have standards that are concrete enough that officers know what they can and cannot do, right? Everyone's safety involved is at stake. And that is true. And I think the standards that are used here in this provision are too vague. Uh, I think that, again, most familiar in my world with the self-defense standards, that is a place to look for concrete uh, language. Again, the requirement that you're not the initial aggressor. Time and time again, I have seen encounters that result in arrests and charges of resisting lawful arrests, right, which start from my black client choosing to walk across the street at the wrong place, going too closely to law enforcement officers, speaking too inappropriately, right, to a law enforcement officer. And these subjective interpretations of the encounter by the officer lead to quickly escalated events. Again, having definite 
concrete standards will help in terms of um, understanding for the officers, right, when uh, lawful use of force is involved, but better yet, right, better yet, and there's been the great discussion about the mental health uh, support that already um, exists in these law enforcement organizations, but better yet is to avoid the use of force issue entirely by changing how law enforcement or how we respond to emergency calls. There are other jurisdictions that have established an alternative to the 911 number, for example, right? Established a different emergency number when there's no immediate danger uh, for uh, physical injury. Sending in response teams that are based and made up of experts in the mental health field, right? We heard about the required skill set needed to respond to a juvenile who's on the autistic spectrum uh, disorder, right? Officers should not be expected to be experts in everything. And we can, we should be responding to these mental health crises accordingly with the skilled cl clinicians and licensed mental health uh, providers instead of local law enforcement. So again, the use of force provision is a start, but it should go further. Uh, Senator Sears uh, has, has uh, and others have talked about the definition of improper restraints uh, going beyond what, you know, what is currently in the bill now, which is uh, restraints as to your ability to breathe. I certainly support that. We have uh, language provided by a recent federal court decision. Now I'm, I'm blanking on it, but describing other restraints that are issue, at issue. Why not include in the definition in the provision itself um, unnecessary use of tasers, right? Stun guns, pepper sprays, and other restraints uh, that we have seen specifically in the context of Woodside, but as discussed there. Moving next to the provisions relating to what I considered accountability, uh, the establishment of the new crime. I mean, frankly, a new crime isn't enough. It's too late, right? It's too late to fix uh, a situation that could have been dealt with in other ways. There are also problems of how many times um, and whether a prosecutor will exercise his or her discretion to prosecute the officer. Uh, but when I look at the discussion on when the council can deal with unprofessional conduct provision. And there is this new category B to incorporate use of uh, improper restraints or standing by and observing that happen, right? And in that language of the provision, it specifically allows the council to respond with the first, uh, first occurrence, right? What I noticed though, is that the other, uh, other acts in category B, sexual harassment with physical touching, excessive use of force and bias, the council is for some reason prohibited from acting in the, first apparent, in the first instance of it. So I revisit that language and make sure that all category B uh, instances should be a situation where the council can act to address directly, right? And then turning to the body cam language, uh, body cameras, it's, it's a good addition and support the requirement to have it uh, as a defense attorney, I regularly see the problem that the video fails, the video isn't used, the video isn't turned on, right? And so again, we need some enforcement mechanism beyond just merely requiring that they get it and deploy it. But what happens when they have it deployed and they don't turn on the button? There should be what's equivalent to the criminal uh, court system, the exculpatory rule, right? Uh, where whenever law enforcement violates the laws, you can't bring that evidence in. Should be the same with a body cam. The, if the officer had the equipment and should have worn it and should have pressed the on button and doesn't, then the officer should not be allowed to come into court and now fill in the blanks with testimony that can't be confirmed but could have been with body camera. I think uh, at this point, again, it's a good start, but more at every level of every provision. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So, Senator Baruth, you have a question. I do. I uh, thank you so much. I appreciated everything you said, but that last thing I found particularly interesting. So, when when you say the exculpatory rule, it exists 
somewhere um, and you're suggesting we import it? It could be, well, exculpatory rule is more of, of, of an idea, it's a remedy and in the law where you violate and I, you know, your rights, your constitutional rights, search and seizure, uh, or, or so you can get it suppressed, right? The evidence suppressed. Here you don't have evidence because you don't have the camera footage because it's not on. So therefore the officer will come in to provide evidence of what happened, what would have been captured by video, right? It should be essentially a prohibition of that officer to not come in and fill in that testimony, right? Uh, unless there is some other explanation or for it. We could do it in, in the, you know, the committee could draft up a rule and the rules of evidence in terms of that. Um, so you're, you're thinking, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, about the charge that might be filed against a client that the defender general might be defending. Um, I was thinking about charges that might be filed against an officer so they don't turn on the button and there's no video of them perhaps deploying deadly force when they shouldn't have. Um, so you were talking about exclusively the first uh, category. I was. I, I didn't think about it as it would apply to the second. That's certainly another situation where I think about, you know, again, the reasons why we have this body camera is accountability, training, yep. assessment of whether it was proper or not. No, and, and I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say, um, I, I think this bill needs a provision that makes clear what the penalties are for not deploying the body camera because it has begun to look like uh, almost an unofficial uh, allowed tactic around the country that it turns out all of the most prominent cases, the, the body cameras either weren't deployed, don't work, et cetera. So there's a, there's a, a last layer that we have to push through there. Yes. Senator Nitka. Yes. If I might, I agree totally with Senator Bluth, but I want to add that to me, this is the beginning. It is not the end. And passage of this bill, and however we form we take, it's not, it certainly is just the beginning. Um, we have a massive problem clearly in this nation and actually in the world. And uh, so this is to me really the beginning. And I want to assure people that as far as Senate Judiciary goes, and I'm sure government operations, appropriations, and other committees in the Senate, the leadership under Senator Ash has made clear that this is a beginning. Senator Sears, I appreciate that, uh, hearing that. And, and as a member of the racial disparities panel that Eitan um, chairs, and we spoke with you about, uh, We'll, we'll, we'll take that and run probably in terms of coming back with, with more suggestions uh, for the session. But it is, it is just beginning and so much has to be considered and addressed. Um, but there are so many exciting ideas and initiatives out there. Uh, and so thank you for, for uh, taking the time to hear from me. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Are there further questions? Senator Benning. Good morning, Rebecca. Um, you went through a list of who needed to be involved in data collection from uh, the physical confrontation in a pedestrian situation right through prosecutorial decisions and court decisions. And I'm gonna throw my own colleagues under the bus for a moment. Why did you leave out defense attorneys? That's that's fair. Certainly public defenders and defense attorneys aren't immune from racial bias at all. You know, um, we all we all live the air and, and the racism and it's inherent. It is in the air. And so absolutely to you know, to the extent that we have concerns or issues in terms of client confidentiality, I think that's where I I, I instinctively drop that off. Um, and um, in terms of, of making sure that we are, um, you know, again, not engaging in racial bias with our own representation. Absolutely, that needs to be a factor and be trained on. Uh, and I'm open to considering the data 
uh, issues there. But again, I'm just sensitive to the issues of confidentiality with, uh, with clients. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you. Next, we have um, Jessica Brown, who's here, the supervising attorney for the Chittenden County Public Defender's Office. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so yeah, for the record, my name is Jessica Brown. I'm the supervising attorney for the Chittenden County Public Defender Office in Burlington. Um, I actually also am an appointee to the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system panel. Um, I was appointed as an at-large community member by Attorney Gen General T.J. Donovan. Um, so I do want to say that the views I'm going to express are my own. They're not meant to represent the panel or my employer. Um, my views, though, are certainly informed by more than 20 years of experience as a public defender representing marginalized people in our communities, um, and certainly also my experiences for a few more than two decades, I won't say exactly how many, as a Black American woman. Um, I believe that the best way to diminish violence in policing and racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile legal systems is by reducing contact between the public and police. To me, this is a concept and a goal that citizens and law enforcement officials alike should all embrace, less need for police in involvement in our communities. To address some of the specific proposals in S-219, um, I agree that race data collection should be uniform and standardized and required for law enforcement agencies across the state. Uh, further, uh, as Rebecca just talked about, I think that race data collection should be uh, should also be required of the courts, the state's attorney's offices, the attorney general's office, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Children and Families, and to the extent that we can do it, the Office of the Defender General, to root out our own biases and also to uh, hold other agencies accountable. Um, at every level of the criminal and juvenile legal systems, there are high impact, high discretion points at which explicit and implicit bias result in disparate treatment of black and brown, indigenous, undocumented, limited English proficient, and other people of color. But collecting data only puts numbers to disparate treatment that we already know is occurring. Um, collecting data is not a solution in and of itself nor to me, quite frankly, is criminalizing more conduct, even if what we're criminalizing is with our laws is uh, violent police conduct. Um, in our system as it currently functions, even laws that are meant to curb police misconduct inevitably end up being wielded most harshly against black and brown people. Um, the nation's attention has been drawn to Minneapolis because of the death of George, George Floyd uh, and the officer who killed George Floyd has been charged, and it will remain to be seen whether he's convicted of any crime. Um, but the officer who killed Philando Castile in Minneapolis was acquitted. Um, to my knowledge, in the last five years, the one Minneapolis police officer who has been convicted of killing a citizen while on duty is the Somali-American officer who shot and killed a white woman who had called police for assistance. Uh, chokeholds uh, have been banned in New York City since 1993. That ban did not prevent the choking death of Eric Garner in 2014. And in fact, the officer who killed Eric Garner worked for the NYPD for another five years after Eric Garner's death. We've seen in our own state that body camera recordings do not prevent police officers from engaging in misconduct nor do body camera recordings necessarily or automatically result in transparent public accountability for police misconduct. Data collection, new, different, more, better training for law enforcement officers, body cameras, new laws to, criminal, to criminalize misconduct by, by law enforcement officers. These are, to my mind, common and natural responses to the recognition that we have to do something about and confront the systemic racism in our criminal and juvenile legal systems, because I feel like these are things that we think that we can start to do fairly quickly. But none of these approaches have solved the problem of systemic racism in our system yet. 
So why do we expect that if we keep trying these same approaches with some changes and some tweaks that we will get different results? I don't believe that we will. So again, I say that I think the best way to diminish violence in policing and racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile legal systems is to reduce contact between the public and police. And I believe that some of the ways that we do that are first of all, by listening to people who have experienced police intervention and or violence at the hands of police. Um, I would encourage this committee to the extent that you can to try to hear directly from black and brown, indigenous, other people of color, undocumented people, people with limited English proficiency, people with mental illness, people with substance use disorders, people with disabilities, victims of intimate partner violence, members of the LGBTQIA plus community and members of other marginalized communities about their experiences with police interventions and what different interventions might have better helped them. Um, I would also say that we should be creating and supporting agencies that are not embedded in police departments to respond to and provide services to address mental health crises, substance use disorders, other medical needs, housing and food instability, and unemployment. We should be developing programs Oops, something's, something's happened to the audio. To engage community volunteers, because when I talk about, I'm sorry, did someone say something? I, I did, but you're back on and okay. You were okay. mute. Keep going, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll close by saying that when I talk about refocusing efforts and resources away from the same types of things that we've tried to reform law enforcement agencies. I do not mean to suggest that we ignore harm or wrongdoing in our communities. Rather, I mean to encourage us to focus our efforts and our resources first on meeting the needs of the most marginalized members of our communities. Because if we're meeting the needs of the most marginalized members of our communities, reduction and harm and wrongdoing will follow and our communities will need less intervention by and interaction with law enforcement agencies, which is ultimately the way we best protect black and brown people from the systemic racism that infects our criminal and juvenile legal systems. Thank you for letting me speak this morning. Happy to answer any questions, although I, realizing, I realize I'm echoing a lot of what's been said by other speakers so far this morning and yesterday. Um, I appreciate I'm you having me. what's going on with her. Thank you, Jessica. I can't unmute her. Um, Joe, Senator Benning, question. Thanks, <clears throat> Jessica, thank you for your testimony. I'm um, curious about the chokehold provision that we're talking about, and I wanna get your opinion. It seems to me there is a very strong difference between the use of a chokehold to detain or restrain we someone. We can't hear you, Senator Benning, either. Can anyone hear me? Uh, yeah. I can hear both Joe and you, Peggy. Yes, can I. I can, I can hear, hear Peggy. Senator Benning. Can people not hear me? Because I did not see that I was muted at any we could, point. We could hear you. It's just your image had frozen. Okay. Hear you now. Fine, though. No. Thank you. Okay. So back to um, chokeholds. Yes. It seems to me there's a clear difference between the use of a chokehold in detaining or restraining someone as opposed to the use of a chokehold if an officer is uh, fighting for their life. And I don't know whether you see a difference there or whether both should be considered strict liability if we were to ban chokeholds. Um, I agree that there's a difference. I, you know, I agree that um, police officers sometimes are defending themselves, um, defending their own lives. Um, and that that should be considered differently and a different standard, a self-defense standard perhaps, um, than uh, simply using, um, and I know that people don't necessarily agree on the terminology of chokehold, but I think that it invokes what we're all talking about, which is restraining someone around their neck, interfering with their breathing. Um, so to answer your question, if what you're asking is, should there be different standards for sort of defense of life um, versus simply restraining someone? Um, yes, I think that's right. 
or I wouldn't disagree with it. I think the challenge becomes, um, and you know, this is what we see and hear so frequently that, um, and the concern I think uh, for people who want to sort of ban chokeholds outright is that it seems very simple for a law enforcement officer to say, I feared for my life and for that to abdicate that law enforcement officer of responsibility for whatever form of restraint or violence they used against someone who was seriously injured or killed. I guess my, my concern is that um, there is at least the perception that the jury process should be removed from that equation. And in a strict liability situation that covers both detention as well as the officer's argument of self-defense, um, there's got to be a line of demarcation somewhere that a jury can look at and say, this clearly went beyond the line. And as a result, we use George Floyd as an example. I don't know how any jury could dismiss that as a murder. Um, but there are other situations that I look at that might be problematic and it would take a jury to decide what the actual facts and totality of circumstances are. I don't know uh, whether you've thought about any particular language that might be in play, because this is the one part of this bill that I'm struggling with, and I, I've got a lot of concerns as a defense attorney, that if we remove that jury analysis um, with a sweeping statement that all chokeholds are banned, we have gone a step too far and we actually could be placing lives at risk. Um, it's just something to think about. If you happen to come up with any suggestions or ideas, I'd like to know what they are. Um, I don't have any suggestions or ideas at the moment, but I really appreciate you sort of outlining it this way. Um, as I And I sort of want to just say it back to you to make sure I'm understanding your issue correctly. I understand what you're saying to be that if there's just sort of strict liability, no chokeholds at all, whether you're trying to restrain someone or whether you are in fear, legitimately in fear for your life, um, your concern is that there actually should be a jury, for example, let's say a police officer gets charged with a, a murder, um, a jury should be able to consider a standard that allows for self-defense by the police officer um, versus um, unlawful restraint. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? That's right. If you, if you apply the chokehold to detain someone or to restrain someone, I think that's clearly beyond the line. And we can fashion language that says that's verboten. Um, where I get very uncomfortable is when we get to the next step where, for whatever reason, there has been escalation. And if that escalation is on behalf of the law enforcement officer, then I agree that there's a problem and we should try to address that. But what I'm concerned about is that when it gets to the ultimate question of whose life is at stake at that moment in time, having a ban on the chokehold might be very problematic for someone who is acting in their own self-defense. And I, I don't know how to get to that dividing line of demarcation that says this is clearly not acceptable and this is something we will at least consider as a possibility. Right, well, can we hear from Senator Baruth because he's raised his hand a couple of times. Uh, Go ahead, Senator. Uh, thank you. So um, Joe said he can't understand how a jury could acquit the officer who killed George Floyd, but I mean, come on. We've seen it happen every single time. We've had one of these with very, very, very few exceptions. And the winning argument is always the officer feared for his life. Often the jury is mostly white. In Vermont, it's fair to say it would be almost all white, almost all the time. All the prosecutors would be white. And the unspoken argument in such a case with a, a person like George Floyd or Eric Garner is that they're large black men. And a large black man is a threat in and of himself. It's never specifically communicated that way to the jury, but that's the, I think, um, the thing that we're fighting against, which is an entrenched attitude that black men are by their presence a threat. And so if an officer tries to bring them under control 
in any situation and they can't, there's a legitimate fear for their life. Hence, they can move to deadly force. So um, I see I see what Joe's saying, but I think what we're saying then is let's just move the ban on chokeholds to a decision that a white jury in Vermont will consider uh, about potentially the, the use of this on a non-white suspect. Um, and I think in that case, we're, we're foregrounding and we're allowing to continue um, a situation where we've seen again and again and again, juries acquit officers under these kinds of assumptions. So uh, I'm for making the ban on chokeholds what it is, uh, which is a ban rather than offering what will amount to an affirmative defense for officers. I think this is a great discussion that we need to have in debate as a committee, and I'm questioning how much time we've got available to do that. And the last thing I'll say about it is that, you know, Matt Valerio, my boss, who I think is on this call, and uh, Rebecca Turner and Marshall Paul um, have a lot more experience than I do at dra drafting and proposing, you know, legislation that they submit um, to committees like this. So I, I'm i sure that this will be an ongoing discussion that um, we'll have, um, you know, as an agency, um, and you'll hear from them probably. Um, you know, I my issues with chokeholds or and or a ban on chokeholds is that as i kind of stated in my in my remarks you know bans don't bans don't necessarily prevent officers from using those types of restraints um and so i understand that what we're talking about here is drafting legislation that will result in con you know potential consequences for using um that form of restraint um, but, um, I'm sorry, a, a message just popped up on the screen and I got distracted. Um, so rather than like trailing off and not making any more sense, I will, uh, sort of leave it at that. Um, I appreciate this discussion and it's certainly something for the defender general's office to talk about and consider, and, um, probably for the racial disparities panel to consider as well. So thanks again for uh, inviting me to speak. Today. Thank, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, next, we'll go to um, Jeffrey Jones, who is waiting there. And he's the Attorney General's appointment to the Racial Disparities Board. Is that correct, Je Jeffrey? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. Um, Please go ahead. Just a, a bit of background. I was the first Black officer in the Vermont State Police. I'm retired now. Huh. Um, I may have some value in terms of experiential, not in terms of drafting. I, that's uh, Jessica and Rebecca who talk about that stuff, and I'm always confused. Um, but a couple points that made notes badly. Um, Senator Benning, I'm, and I agree with you, to me there's a real s obvious path to me, which is that a chokehold is a lethal force, and if defined under the rules of lethal force in Vermont for police departments, that's a much higher level, which uh, requires, it's a higher level of, of, of action, okay? And I think looking down that road might be beneficial. You can't, it's beyond, how do I put this? Uh, if someone's running away and you shoot them in the back and they're unarmed, that's pretty clear, right? That's not, if you're in fear, you shouldn't be a cop, okay? And for Floyd, four guys are kneeling on him and he feels in fear, so he kills him. That's murder, where I come from. And, you know, I, I, I look on that kind of perhaps ignorant point of view. Um, I think the laws are not necessary for the good cops who are the vast majority, but there's a certain kind of cop out there on Vermont Street, and I've seen it, saw it for many, many years, who's the kind of guy that had his lunch money taken away from him in junior high school, and he's getting his back, and he's got a taser, and he's got a gun, and nobody's gonna diss him. And uh, that's a very small minority, but that's, but that's a reality. I'm sorry, I really believe that. Um, I made some bad notes. 
One is that tasers should be more closely controlled because that's frequently, this sounds like an overstatement, but an instrument of torture. It leaves no marks that a club will, it doesn't give you a broken nose, but I've seen people deploy the taser on people in handcuffs or in cells. I'm think, sure we've all seen that. And it becomes an instrument of, oh yeah, let me show you what it's really about. Um, so I'd like to see that addressed. Um, sorry if I'm going oddly around and around. Um, Trooper O'Neill, I agree with everything you say. If you're still on, I don't have your name up now. Um, and the only other thing that I'd like to see, and I didn't see, and this came out of uh, Ms. Turner's something she wrote, which is, I've been thinking more about it, the militarization of Vermont police. Uh, it was something she has added to the RDAP um, briefing, which I'm sure will be in front of you as soon as we get our act together. I would like to see a statewide vetting process for the acquisition of military weapons. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're not necessary. I'm not clear that all the training is with sufficient discipline and familiarization. And um, I don't see a use policy over covering them or a training policy over covering them. And pretty much you can ask for I mean, everybody's got an M14 now. I don't know if everybody needs an M14. Um, I think that's it. I, uh, I would be happy to answer questions if I can. Um, certainly, the only, I'd like to close with the fact that resisting arrest can be created very, very easily. If you and I are standing there talking about the weather and I grab your wrist and you snatch it back, that's resisting arrest, arrest with no warning. That's a normal human response and really should be looked at with, with some critical eye. I'm sorry, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know where to go with this, but there it is. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Benning? So Jeff, I, I'm gonna say as a 37 year defense attorney, I've seen plenty of bad apples. I've seen plenty of situations where resisting arrest is created and it has always bothered me that we don't have some way of um, creating a policy that all police will de-escalate before they escalate a situation that leads us to many of the situations that we're now talking about. I remain concerned about strict liability at the level of you as a police officer being under legitimate deadly force threatening your life. None of us would question your ability to raise your gun if there is a gun pointed directly at you. I'm trying to reach that same place with a chokehold maneuver that if universally swept into this category might prevent you from defending yourself at that moment in time. While at the same time, I appreciate my colleague, Senator Bruce's concern that we've had this long history of situations that were escalated as a result of police conduct. And then this situation gets created where they decide to use that and they might get in front of a jury and be let off. I appreciate that concern. I'm trying to figure out how to design a line of demarcation, which enables a police officer who is legitimately under threat of deadly force to be able to use that as well as any other maneuver to save their own life at that moment in time without sweeping them all under the rug at once. Um, I, I guess it's just a comment to make because of your testimony and not a question directly to you. Although I'll close with one question to you that has been bugging me since you came on. Is that a picture of Homer, Alaska behind you? No, i sorry to bug you. That's a, a picture of Sagnau Fjord in Norway, where I'm on vacation. It, it I'm looks sure. exactly like the fjord in Homer, Alaska. That's what- I think it's very similar. Bugging similar me. It's a great place, yes. great shot. Thank you. Thanks so for your comments. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Gregory. I just, um, Jeffrey, I mean, I just wanted to uh, tell you that um, I chair government operations and your comment about the uh, statewide policy on militarization of law enforcement agencies. We are looking at that in that committee. So there are two committees looking at all of these issues and we have that on our radar and are taking testimony on that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, are, any further questions? Okay, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank you. And next on our schedule and to conclude the testimony is Drew Bloom, the use of force instructor at the Vermont State, VS, no, for VSEA, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Drew. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, good morning. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me because I just, I just got on. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I, I appreciate it. And there's really so much that I could talk about, and I'm not sure how much time I'm going to be uh, allotted. But just to give you, you folks some background, I was asked to come on today by, by VSEA, but I also uh, am an employee at the Vermont Police Academy. I'm one of the directors there. And uh, I've been a law enforcement officer in Vermont for just over 30 years now, starting uh, in, with my career back uh, in 1990, uh, working in Tittany County for the Burlington and then uh, South Burlington Police Departments. I went to the DMV Enforcement Division, was uh, ended up being a captain there when I retired from there in 2017 and went to the academy to become one of the, one of the directors. Awesome. I've been teaching use of force to law enforcement officers since 1992. Um, I started teaching as adjunct staff at the police academy in 1994, and uh, I've had the opportunity over the course of my career to be so passionate about this topic for the safety of officers, for the safety of their agencies, and for the safety of the citizens that they serve. Throughout my career in law enforcement in Vermont, I've been privileged to do so many wonderful things and experience so many different aspects of this job. But any promotion that I've taken, any assignment that I've had has always been with the caveat that if I'm not going to be permitted to be teaching use of force, I'm not going to take the job because it's been that passionate to me because I had a, a, a very uh, emotional event happen early in my career that kind of set me on this path. Um, since then, I've been a part of the uh, Safari Land Training Academy as well, which is an international organization that teaches use of force to law enforcement officers all over the world. And about three years ago, I was appointed as an advisory board member to that uh, entity. And I've had the opportunity to teach and train with law enforcement officers in foreign countries as far away as Singapore. I've been down to Trinidad, I've been in the, throughout the Caribbean, and I've been in all different jurisdictions throughout this country and in Canada instructing over, over the course of my career. I'm a certified force analyst through the Force Science Institute. I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy, and I've been an expert witness several times in federal lawsuits for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and I've consulted for uh, the Vermont Attorney General's Office and for numerous police agencies and have also been uh, helpful in, in guiding other states in some of their centralized training practices as they've wanted to use Vermont as a model for use of force training because we are very fortunate in the fact that we are standardized here, meaning that every single officer in this state goes through the same amount of training. Before I get into the, the, the bill and a, some of my concerns through with the bill. Through. I'm going to interrupt for just a minute. You have 10 minutes, and I just want to tell you that Senator Sears is on the phone listening. So go ahead with your testimony. Okay. Thank you, Senator, uh, and thank you, Senator Sears. Uh, I remember working with you many years ago when uh, there was no identity theft statute in Vermont, and uh, I worked with you on that in your committee back then. Um, in any event, I want to talk about how use of force is trained from a legal perspective because not only do we train at the basic training level, the, the psychomotor skills that are necessary for officers to, uh, to have when they're, when they're using force at a wide range of levels across the use of force continuum, but they also spend a tremendous amount of time in the academic aspects of use of force. In fact, the, the, the use of force classroom block of instruction alone has 257 slides in the PowerPoint with numerous different blocks of instruction, ranging from 
the legalities of use of force, the medical implications of their force decisions, the documentation of force, along with several other topics that are all interrelated that they must know and have an, a, a thorough and sound understanding of those academics. Use of force uh, nationwide and in Vermont since 1989 has been directly linked to the Civil Rights Act. And there have always been both civil and criminal penalties for officers that are found to have been using excessive force, not only at the federal level where there are criminal penalties in which an officer could be investigated by the FBI and indicted in a, in, in, at the federal level, and of course, through civil litigation, through a, a, a 1983 lawsuit. Uh, and that happens you know, when officers are, are uh, suspected of using unreasonable excessive force. In Vermont, officers also face numerous criminal penalties here already that are on the books if they're found to have used excessive force. And some of those statutes include things like simple assault, aggravated assault, unlawful restraint, right. and also a neglect of duty if an officer fails to intervene, if they witness another officer doing something inappropriate. There are already statutes on the books here that would, that would cover those things. Prior to 1989, the standard for use of force in this country was force that was referred to as if something would shock the conscience of a citizen, then it could be potentially found to be excessive. The U.S. Supreme Court sought to take the subjectivity out of that in 1989 in the, in the landmark case of Graham v. Connor. And that case has withstood the test of time since, that, since then for a, a host of reasons. The Supreme Court did an outstanding job in giving law enforcement officers tools to make that calculus of reasonableness. And they looked at things like the severity of the crime, whether or not the suspect involved posed an immediate threat to the officer or others, whether or not they were actively resisting or attempting to evade, which means active resistance is taking an affirmative action to resist the facilitation of control. And the court also recognized that this would have to be occurring in tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving circumstances. And they said at that time that force was going to be based on another reasonable and prudent law enforcement officer's knowledge based on their similar levels of training and experience, knowing without the benefit of 2020 hindsight, only the facts and circumstances that they had known to them at the time of this incident. Now, we also have to take into account all of the different perceptual and circumstantial factors that go into coming up with the calculus of reasonableness. Things like age, size, gender, number of officers versus number of suspects, special circumstances or knowledge that you may have had of an individual prior to that encounter, uh, whether or not there's an injury or exhaustion that occurs during a struggle, being on the ground in an uncontrolled combative situation, being within close proximity to weapons, having those weapons available, all of those things change uh, the circumstances. And that is why when we assess reasonableness for use of force, each case must be assessed individually. So if you have four or five officers on a scene and there's an allegation of excessive force, each officer must be assessed individually. It cannot be done as a group. So since the landmark decision of Graham, our own Vermont Supreme Court in 1993 echoed Graham in Colby Johnson and the city of Rutland, which was a 1993 Vermont Supreme Court case. And in that case, our own Supreme Court said that we will have the Graham standard here in Vermont. Now, since then, since Graham in 1993, or in 1989, rather, I'm sorry, there have been numerous other cases that uh, we have had to rely on when we teach use of force from a legal, from a legal standpoint. And we teach a principle at the academy that's known as quantum of force, which means that not only must an officer choose the most reasonable option to overcome a level of resistance and to, to facilitate control, but if they have any time whatsoever when making that decision, they not only have to pick the most reasonable option, but they have to also pick the least dangerous option. And the courts have told us that we have to consider the availability of less injurious alternative methods of capture. We have to consider what an officer may have known about someone's mental condition, health condition, or other relevant frailties that they must have. All of these things have to be done in a split second, making these decisions in a split second. It's very, very difficult. Now, part of this legislation, I also noted, uh, takes some language from Tennessee versus Garner when it addresses using deadly force 
to uh, apprehend a fleeing felon, which, of course, Tennessee Gardner was the 19, famous 1985 landmark U.S. Supreme Court case. The legislation that I've read here has some aspects of Tennessee Gardner, but in Vermont, this is even more restrictive as things, are, as things stand today. In Vermont right now, in order for an officer to use deadly force to apprehend, stop a fleeing felon, they have to have probable cause, which is, of course, a much higher standard than reasonable suspicion. They have to have probable cause to believe that that person has committed a violent felony or is about to commit a violent felony. They have to have probable cause to believe that if they allow that individual to escape, that individual is very likely to cause serious bodily injury or death to another. They also have to warn that person or they have to be prepared to articulate why they were they couldn't warn that person if they if they did not and they also have to be able to show that they have exhausted all other means of capture before utilizing deadly force and when we talk about the necessity standard versus the reasonableness standard this terrifies me for several reasons an officer will always want to use the least amount of force they will always want to use the minimum amount of force. They will always want to use only force that is necessary. At the police academy, we spend in basic training and in training at all levels a tremendous amount of time teaching de-escalation. And when people think of de-escalation, they think about it as using good verbal skills, using the circumstances to prevent confrontation. And from day one of use of force training, I teach our officers to sacrifice your ego to avoid conflict because it's not about you. It's about the safety and security of the communities that we are guardians of. We don't teach cops to be warriors. We teach them to be community guardians. Warriors are for war. And that's not our goal at the academy. And that's not something that, that we, that we uh, strive to do. When we have to use reasonable force, the courts have already taught us how we come up with that calculus. You can never know what the least, the minimum, or necessary amounts of force are. And here's an example. If there is a very physically fit-looking uh, male subject, say 26 years old, and he's armed with uh, a, a knife, and he is approaching me saying, I'm going to kill you with this weapon, my perception as a law enforcement officer is going to be, this is a situation that is deadly force. This individual has the ability they have the opportunity, and the jeopardy is real, the threat is imminent, and it's immediate. It's happening right now. So I would be justified in my own mind to draw my firearm and use deadly force. However, all I may have to do is tell the person to drop the knife and yell at them, hey, drop the knife, and they may do it. So the least amount of force was nothing more than a verbal command. That was the minimum amount of force. That was only the force that was necessary. But me as the officer would have absolutely no way of knowing that because I cannot get into their head. What makes me nervous about the necessity standard also is that if an officer takes an action that is potentially uh, conflicting with their training and they help to create a jeopardy, then they can be liable for that. That scares me. An example of that would be something to the effect of we try to train officers to stand clear of doorways, stay out of open hallways, just because it's not a tactical place to be. Now, let's say just hypothetically an officer has to stand in a hallway because a flower pot's in the way or a potted plant or something. So they're in the hallway. A subject jumps out. He's armed with a firearm. He's pointing at the officer. The officer now has to use deadly force to save his own life and to mitigate the threat. So it could then potentially be argued that the officer did something contrary to the training and patrol procedures, which was not to stand in doorways. So because of that, the use of deadly force was not necessary. So that scares me when we talk about a necessity standard. When it comes to the, uh, the, the point, one point in the legislation where it mentions that officers are allowed to uh, use force to effect an arrest, that's correct. But there are also two other circumstances where officers are allowed to uh, place handcuffs on somebody and take them into custody. One, of course, is when they have probable cause to arrest them. The second circumstance is when they're taking an individual into custody because they're a danger to themselves or others, which is known by known as uh, protective custody. And the third circumstance, which is not mentioned in this legislation, is when officers are, are uh, placing handcuffs on someone during an investigative detention, which they're permitted to do only 
and this is very, very specifically taught, only when they can articulate that there is a safety threat to themselves or someone else on scene. And this is during a detention when they have reasonable suspicion, but they have not yet established circumstances that rise to the level of probable cause to arrest. So there are really three circumstances when an officer can be handcuffed. Drew, I'm going to stop you there. Drew, I'm going to stop you there and see if people have questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Senator Sears, and I do have a question, Drew, and thank you so much for your testimony. I do remember you from way back when. Um, I, and your, you know, your testimony is, is right on on a number of those cases. You cite some Supreme Court cases, et cetera. But I will say that um, despite all the best training, things can go awry. And I'm thinking of a young man that I used to have in my program in Bennington who was a person of color. Uh, he, you know, let's, he could be a pain in the neck. I can remember having him up in Canada on an Algonquin trip canoeing. And he would say things and kind of get my goat. And I would kind of kid with him and, and, and work with him. And, and it never got physical, never got to a point where uh, anybody had to restrain anybody or anything else. But it could really get to you sometimes what he would say. Um, um, so I understand frustration sometimes. But that young man ended up uh, leaving our program, did fairly well for a while, and then got into some trouble. And in the Rutland police station, he was beaten. Um, event, event, eventually won a lawsuit against the Rutland Police Department. So despite all the best training and so forth, um, sometimes things go awry. And luckily, uh, this young man, whom I consider a a good guy, you know, not you know somebody who I would happily have in my home anytime. Um, you know, got kind of put out there, and, and I don't know if it was because of the color of his skin, or because of what he said, or whatever else. Um, but it certainly uh, it did lead to some shakeup in the Rutland City Police Department, and some positive things came out. But this young man took. Um, and I, so I, I think we too often think, well, Vermont's immune from this. It's not. And despite all your good training and all that you do to try to uh, improve the process, those things happen. And I, I feel the need to comment on that. You, you may comment if you wish, but having known that personally and having um, spent time with him, um, I understand what happened but it doesn't excuse what happened. And that's where my problem comes in. And, and I would absolutely agree with you. And I can tell you that there have been times where I've assessed cases for reasonableness and I've said the cops wrong and they need to pay for what they did. And I think any use of force trainer would say the same thing if they're worth their, worth their weight. Uh, and that's, and that has been something that uh, I've, I've held very near and dear for the 30 years that I've been involved, been involved in this business, which is a difficult business. Um, they don't belong and they should pay for it. And uh, I'd be the first one to, to stand up because when someone does something contrary to, to, to policing practices and best practices and something that is contrary to what likely I taught them to do, it infuriates me. And I think that they, that they should have to pay for that. And there are penalties that are in place for that right now. What I would like to caution this committee and these committees on in the legislature is that it is so difficult right now for officers to make these split second decisions in high stress when there is, there is a degree of adrenalization going on and it is hypersensitive. It is so difficult right now for these cops. When I train these young men and women in the classroom and I talk about their obligations for reasonable application of force, and this starts, uh, this starts with me on the second, the second week of their academy training, they, they get this, this block in the classroom. And I can see the looks on their faces when they realize for the first time that it's not like on TV. And when they realize the liabilities that are involved and how difficult it is and all of the steps throughout the use of force model and continuum that they have to know and memorize and then learn the skills that they have to be able to uh, execute 
you know, just responding to a stimulus in a split second, it really can, can make your head spin. I'd like to address the portion of the legislation also that talks about, about chokeholds. Drew, well, first of all, Drew, before, yep. you go, before you do that, um, Senator Baruth has a question. Uh, half question, half comment. So um, I take Drew's point about uh, adrenaline and anxiety and, and, uh, and fear on the part of a police officer. But what I would say is a police officer is backed by the force, their cruiser, their duty belt, uh, other officers who are on call to come and support them. Where we started this conversation was what is being experienced by people of color in America writ large and in Vermont in particular. And trust me, their anxiety exceeds the level that an officer um, might experience as a situation develops um, because they have no weapon and they know that even raising their hand or reaching for their wallet to get their ID could wind up with them dead on the street. So I, I feel as though this conversation always segues into um, let's understand the situation of the officer and all the stress they're under and yes, there's a dead person on the street, but really that officer was just terrified. And I don't mean to minimize it, but I, I feel that we, we always wind up circling back to it as a way to get away from, uh, and here I go to my question, um, creating a penalty for a police officer who uses the wrong sort of force at the wrong time. So this legislation creates a category that specifically mentions law enforcement um, and the reason why I prefer that is that if you go into court and you try to hold an officer uh, to the charge of aggravated assault, um, juries, I think, look at the situation and they say, here's a nice clean cut young officer who was pursuing their duty, trying to protect the public. Do I really want to convict them of aggravated assault? Did they really set out to commit a crime? And I think that's one of the reasons why you wind up with so many acquittals, even when you have this on uh, video. So if you ask a jury um, to convict under this crime as it's described, what you're saying is, did that officer use a restraint that was forbidden? Yes, they did. Then we're going to hold them accountable. So um, I would ask Drew, do you see a difference between, in that sense, between the situation that um, a jury might find themselves in with an aggravated assault charge and a police officer and this crime as created here. I, I can't comment as to whether or not I see a difference because I've, I've never been charged with aggravated assault um, and I've never been charged with a crime and had to have a jury trial. Um, I would think that that would be uh, in, in either of those circumstances, I think it would be horrifying and uh, and completely devastating, regardless of what what the charge is. So I really can't comment on one being any worse than the other because they're both uh, felonies that are are absolutely terrifying. So I would think that having having either of those things hanging over my head would be would be terrifying. Um, I, I would like to talk about if if uh, in, in, unless you would like to to follow up with that, sir. I would like to talk about, you know, my my thoughts about the chokehold section of the legislation. Drew, Drew, could you do that very briefly as you're over your time limit? And yes, I, I'll try to wrap up as quickly as I can. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say that we've never we've never taught chokeholds at the police academy. We've never instructed any arrest technique in where any pressure is allowed to be placed on someone's head, neck. Or spine. When someone has to be handcuffed in a prone position, when they've been combative, uh, this is done as quickly as possible by immobilizing the shoulder and controlling their arm. And officers are trained to get that person onto their side, seated up, and standing up as quickly as possible. They're also trained to not only ensure that the person is breathing, but they have to ask them, are you breathing? That's part of the talk track of what we train them to say. And then we also 
ensure that they understand the medical implications of their action and get any medical medical help that that person needs as quickly as possible, immediately on scene in the, during that incident. Now, we do teach at a very high level in the ground fighting instructor school, and we've taught these since 1996, some lateral vascular neck restraints that can result in serious bodily injury or death. They can only be used if you can use your firearm. They can only be used at deadly force if deadly force is reasonable. And there may be circumstances where that happens. If an officer, and, these, and as I said, these are not taught in basic training. Uh, these are taught to advanced instructors that have already been u regular use of force instructors, and then they can come to the ground defense instructor school. And the focus of most of that class is not on neck restraints, but there are some portions of it that do teach them, and they are deadly force only techniques. Uh, they can only be used at that level. And there may be some times if an officer is on the ground and somebody's got their gun or the gun is out of the holster uh, or it's not operative and they're being murdered, um, a strike to the throat, a technique that involves a neck restraint to the throat, that might be reasonable uh, and it might be okay. And then for an officer to then be charged with a 20-year felony for, for trying to save their, their life or the life of someone else, you know, if there's someone on top of somebody else on the ground murdering them, do you necessarily want an officer to use their firearm to shoot that person off of them and potentially have a round pass through that individual into you or miss that individual and hit you? I would rather they do a neck restraint if it's a deadly force situation. And I, I think that these belong in deadly force, but I think to prohibit them, uh, I, I I, I think it's it's really very, very dangerous. In 2017, a, a paper went out nationally as a best practice recommendation. It's called the National Consensus Policy and Discussion Paper on Use of Force. It was written by 12 of the most prominent law enforcement entities in the country to include the International Association of Chiefs of Police, CALEA, which does law enforcement accreditation, uh, the Association for Academy Trainers, and they specifically addressed chokeholds in this paper, and they said that chokeholds belong at deadly force, and that is the only place that they should ever be used and authorized. And I, I agree with that, and I think to take that away from us and to make it a potential 20-year felony is, is horrible. I, I, there's, no other, there's no other thing I can say because to, to say never, ever, ever, no matter what, you know, if someone's got my gun and I can't get their hand off my gun, uh, I'm going to want to grab them by the throat because I can't think of much else in that circumstance that I might be able to do. Thank you. And Drew. I can tell you this. Drew. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. There's a lot of information that you gave, so appreciate it. But we, we do need to end the testimony now, in fairness to everybody. And Sure. I understand. Thank you. Very nice of you to come and speak. We appreciate it. So next, um, we, I don't know if we want to have any discussion of this now, I think we're going to tomorrow do a um, discussion of the bill and see what happens. So there are a lot of things to think of. Um, Drew, you might give that last information piece that you said, if you can email something to Peggy Delaney and tell her what that what that policy was that you just mentioned. It, I think it would be helpful. Yes, I, I have it and I can, I can send it along. Um, I, and I think I can, I can find her email address easily enough. Uh, she's right here. P Delaney at ledge leg dot state dot vt dot us. Okay. I'll, uh, yep. Senator I'll send that off. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sears. Dallas, yeah. Uh, First of all, terrific job of running the committee, listening to you doing this uh, while I was remotely here and there and everywhere. Um, so I did a terrific job, and I thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment, maybe get an impression. We heard a lot of testimony today, and uh, Drew's testimony was certainly compelling. On the other hand, frequently in law, we place in affirmative defenses, and I wonder if Fred would consider an affirmative defense that a police officer feared for his life, his or her life, and as a result, uh, used some form of 
some chokeholds um, in that portion of the legislation. It seems to me that um, this, this description that that Drew provided, um, and I believe Chief Blackos and others talked about um, that that's one way we've dealt with these things in the past. And uh, just for the committee to consider for tomorrow, and I don't know if Brent has any comment on that or anyone else on the committee does, but I'll mute myself again and uh, so you don't have to hear the sounds of the Route 9 headed to Troy. I mean, headed from Troy to Bennington. Right. Uh, before your question, Senator Bruce, can we just hear from Bryn? Sure. Hi, Bryn. Hi, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, I, it's my understanding that you'd like to see um, an affirmative defense in um, section six of the bill, to the new clear, crime on law I, I wouldn't, I, restraint. I, I, I don't want it to uh, be misunderstood. I would oppose that. Okay, so um, we'll just have it. Could you yeah. just do it as a draw it up as a possible amendment? And then I will do that. For that. Um, if I could ask a question of Bryn. So Bryn, an affirmative defense means, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that the legislation offers it and strengthens that defense um, as opposed to it being a defense that might be offered in absence if the, if the law was silent on it. Um, am I right on that? Bryn? Sorry, I, Senator, I couldn't hear you there for a moment. Um, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm losing my sound, so could you repeat oh, that? Um, my understanding of what an affirmative defense is, is that um, if, if it was not included in the legislation, it doesn't mean that defense couldn't be brought forward, but it's stronger if the legislation offers it as an affirmative defense. Is that, you're muted, Bryn. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so that is true. I think that the way that the, um, that the crime is currently drafted because it's, a, um, it's, it's set up right now as a strict liability offense, um, adding an affirmative defense may make it clear um, in, under those circumstances that the, um, anyone who's being charged under that uh, crime could, could raise uh, the defense of self-defense. So I just, I just want to say, and I hope I'm not putting too fine a point on it, we, we would be, in the case of George Floyd, that officer is going to argue that he needed to use that technique of cutting off the wind of George Floyd. If there was an affirmative defense in their statute, he would then have a stronger case. The other thing I just want to point out is, uh, from my reading about that case, in Minnesota, certain senior officers are qualified to use chokeholds. And they're, they're in the same way that was just described to us by Drew, he said that the ground defense instructor school teaches them, but not to basic training, to advanced officers. And my reading on the Minnesota case is similar, that they have, uh, their training program doesn't teach them at the basic level, but for people who are cleared for higher levels, they are taught. So I, I think, honestly, the worst thing we could do is put in an affirmative defense that says, essentially, all you have to do is say that you feared for your life and you are retroactively cleared from having used a chokehold. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I feel like what we have now in the draft is a very clear piece of language. And I, I think the affirmative defense actually goes in the worst direction, which would be to say, um, go ahead and offer this defense. I would totally disagree. Um, First of all, uh, I brought it up only to have something to consider tomorrow, Philip. I didn't. I, but I, I don't agree that um, a case like the officer in George Floyd's case could find 
any way of defending himself that the chokehold was necessary to avoid George Floyd uh, killing him from what we've seen. So I'm not sure how that ever comes in. But it's merely a thing that we've used in the past um, uh, that I, I wanted to have a debate on it. I don't even know. Um, but I, I, So I, I appreciate your comment, but it, it's not intended to... Um, it's intended to, to deal with what we've heard from testimony about a concern uh, having the felony of uh, in there. Um, you know, obviously, um, the law enforcement folks who testify would rather not have it in there at all. The whole crime. So, so I was trying to respond to. But certainly, we should debate that. And I was just asking for it. Yes. Yeah, so Senator Benning uh, would like to make a comment also. So using George Floyd's situation, there is an officer who is placing his knee on George Floyd's neck. There are two other officers who are helping keep him on the ground. And my recollection of the video is there's another officer who is walking around trying to figure out exactly what to do. Hypothetically, if that one officer went up to the officer whose knee is on George Floyd's neck and put a chokehold on the officer, this bill would have that officer automatically facing a felony. And that's where I get into real trouble with this situation because the, the way it's designed sweeps everybody under the rug. And if the officer was actually trying to save George Floyd's life in that process, We've just damned him to a felony charge. Well, I, I mean, Joe, I feel now, now you're taking the creation of a hypothetical to an absurd level. You're saying we need chokeholds so that officers can choke each other to save. I, I mean, what's I, absurd about that, Philip? Well, what, what's I mean, absurd in 37 about thirty-seven years of criminal law, I've been in a hell of a lot of juries, what, and I've been in a hell of a lot of situations where I know virtually everything under the sun comes into play. We're not responding to cases where officers couldn't use a restraint and were killed. We're responding to cases where they are using restraints and killing people on camera, which and should I be banned. Wanna, I just want to make one point. One more point. If you remember the Rodney King beating um, was the really the first of this sequence that we've seen of police brutality captured on camera. And I would point out the, the Bell Events video, which I sent around to the committee. That's not 1993. That's last year in Burlington. So um, in the Rodney King beating, there were a whole series of officers with metal batons hitting Rodney King putting him in the hospital, breaking his zygomatic arch, which is an incredibly difficult bone in the body to break. Um, and it was all captured on video. When they went to a jury, they said, look, Rodney King is, uh, is a large man. He was in angles that the camera couldn't capture. He was making aggressive movements. So yes, you seem to see the whole video but there are things you can't see, and that's where the defense created space for the officers to abuse those tactics, and they were, in fact, acquitted. Now, go back to the George Floyd video. When they get into court, the George Floyd lawyer, uh, I'm sorry, the lawyer for the person who killed George Floyd, is going to argue that that video presents an incomplete portrait, and really, George Floyd remained a threat and that's why the officer continued to have his knee on his neck. So I don't want to aid in that sort of defense, which is a kind of ex post facto, you know, wiping away of guilt for an officer who committed murder, in my opinion. Okay. I understand. Uh, I, I also we? understand we're out of time, Alice, so I'll, I'm not going to respond at this moment. I think this is a great debate that we need to have. We just don't have time to do it right now. That's part of my frustration about where we are on the Zoom process. That's correct. So, oh, Jeanette, you haven't had a chance to say much. No, I just was going to say, are we going to have a chance tomorrow to um, just discuss this as a committee without having 
I mean, people can join us, but without having witness testimony so that we can we can grapple with it, some of these issues. Is that the plan? The plan is to meet at nine tomorrow and go over the bill with Bryn, what we have with Bryn, and obviously have some discussions. Okay, because I had some comments on this um, last issue here, but I'll save them for tomorrow. That would be good. Okay, very good. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, a lot of 11 witnesses in that period of time was, was great to hear from all of them. Senator Sears, thanks a lot for being out there. Bryn, thank you. And Peggy you. for arranging complicated Zoom today. So uh, we'll see you tomorrow. For many of you, we'll see you in a, in a few minutes.